So yesterday you saw me wearing the hat of looking at urban sustainability. Today we're going to be talking about the hinterlands or actually learning about sustainable low carbon initiatives that use forestry, but also other types of landscapes to not only capture carbon, but to provide a lot of other services that we need to not only support human society, but global ecosystems. And kind of by accident, I realized that this program has been sandwiched by two really impressive examples of nature-based solutions to climate change. You have the opening from the minister from Bhutan, which has really focused on these amazing nature-based solutions in the Asia Pacific region. And today you're gonna to get an insight into Costa Rica, which has been a really uh, big player in reforestation to fight climate change, as well as biodiversity loss in the Americas. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to start my slide. And usually I, I put animations on slide, but I actually took them out on this one um, because uh, it's a little easier to pace myself when I see all the text come up. So let's get going. And I've kind of given this answer away already, but who can tell me where this strange looking gentleman is? Any guesses? Where do you think I was when these pictures were taken? Costa Rica. Yeah, this is Costa Rica. You can kind of tell, so the animals here, you see a toucan and a sloth. These are both uh, species that are endemic to the Americas. You don't see them in uh, other continents. And uh, where I'm standing is actually 30, 40 years ago was just pasture land. And it's really, been the regrowth of these secondary forests that have taken Costa Rica from having some of the highest deforestation rates in the Americas to having some of the lowest within four short decades. But we'll get into that a bit later. Let's use some building blocks first to know what we're talking about when we talk about nature-based solutions. So nature-based solutions are simply actions to protect, manage, or restore ecosystems and then the co-benefit with these types of actions is that they also address societal challenges. Often, and especially for this program, we're going to talk about climate change. So planting trees and other forms of vegetation, trees soak up carbon. They are carbon stock. And that's a really important initiative that's been happening since the Paleolithic era is vascular plants have been soaking up carbon that helps fight global warming. But you also have these other benefits. So you have food and water security when you have healthy ecosystems, um, reduced disaster risk, especially around coastal and wetland areas, and improved human health benefits. Uh, so for example, a common problem is the flooding of coastal areas. And as human beings, we seem to love to settle in coastal areas despite coastal erosion and storm surges. So while this challenge, and traditionally, I really just mean for the last 100 years, has been tackled by gray infrastructure, such as some things like seawalls, uh, coastal flooding can also be addressed by actions that take advantage of ecosystem services. So moving from a gray infrastructure, such as a seawall, towards, for example, planting mangroves that not only prevent erosion, but serve as some kind of defense against storm surges. Um, so that's really just what we're talking about when we're talking about nature-based solutions. Uh, people were doing this for millennia. We kind of, a lot of our societies around the world focused on shifting to gray infrastructure as a solution in the last 100 years. But increasingly, we're realizing there are lots of benefits towards shifting back towards managing living ecosystems instead of just human infrastructure in response to a problem, especially when it comes to climate change. So one recent suggestion from World Bank estimates that nature-based solutions could provide up to 37% of the mitigation needed until 2030 to achieve the Paris Agreement. That's over one third. And remember, while these might be technically difficult to manage, trees and other forms of vegetation and ecosystems can be difficult to manage, 
it's nothing human beings have not done before. We're not talking about creating a new technology. We're not talking about launching or upscaling an energy system that's never been trialed before. We have existed in living memory at a time where forests and other ecosystems took up a much larger part of the planet. And we can return to that or at least move closer to it. So if you simply, if you plant trees, they're going to soak up carbon. And uh, there are many ways to do this. You don't just need to go in and plant in very marginalized landscapes. Restoring native forest at the margins of a river um, can avoid landscapes, but it also acts as a carbon sink. So you get this idea of co-benefits. Uh, we talked a little bit about that in the cities module. You're going to see it pop up again any more in this nature-based solutions module. Um, another thing um, that nature-based solutions kind of touch with food systems is you get climate smart agriculture. So trying to work with farmers to retain more carbon in their fields as they produce crops. One of the things we forget is trees aren't the only part of living ecosystems that sequester carbon, soils themselves do. And agriculture, because our agricultural systems around the world have become so intensive, tend to also treat soils quite poorly and poor soil does not sequester as much carbon. However, if we shift towards more climate smart agriculture, we can keep the gains in food productivity while still sequestering more carbon in our soils. And then of course, the classic example that you'll hear more about in Costa Rica's case is decreasing forest deforestation. Um, so there's this concept called payment for ecosystem services and it pays rural landowners, farmers, ranchers, not to cut down forest uh, ecosystems. And then it's the idea that these people are stewards of the land and therefore they should be paid to maintain forests or other natural landscapes the same way they're used to produce uh, agricultural products. Instead of just mitigation, nature-based solutions are also probably going to play a pretty important role in climate adaptation. So um, World Bank, uh, again, this is an organization that uh, many of you have probably heard of, but in the last five years, they've become very proactive on this idea of nature-based solutions. And the end of the day, the reason for this is because they tend to be more cost-effective than gray infrastructure. Um, so a lot of projects that have been funded by the World Bank look at helping manage disaster risk and reduce incidents and impact of flooding, as well as other natural disasters. But with climate change adaptation, trying to mitigate impacts of flooding, especially in urban areas, especially in coastal areas, is playing an increasingly important role. And you get a better investment using nature-based solution than a lot of gray infrastructure that needs to be replaced every 20, 30 years. And so, as I said, these are cost-effective ways for addressing climate change, especially in those communities. Um, and the nice thing that World Bank and other funders like about nature-based solutions is they often address several problems at once. So you don't have to try to tackle everything individually. The key thing to remember though, is while you can have co-benefits, it's not automatic that everything you plant becomes a nature-based solution. So for example, Planting trees that are not from the region that might be toxic to local animals, that's actually not going to give your biodiversity co-benefits. This is a big debate with what we see things like plantation forestry for palm and bamboo. Okay, yeah, these plants are soaking up carbon, that's a climate benefit, but if you're not actually supporting the animals and plants of the ecosystem that the plantation forestry is going into, you're not actually helping biodiversity in the region, you're hurting it. So again, nature-based solutions certainly open up the door for co-benefits. There's nothing saying that they're all going to have co-benefits though. And in fact, some of them might not be that good with co-benefits. Just something to keep in mind. The question all researchers dread but have to wrestle with, how do you measure results from a nature-based project? Well, most nature-based solutions that we work with at the international and national level, use an evidence-based approach. And so um, governments and funders want to know how much carbon is being sequestered in these nature-based solution and what other impacts these projects are having. Um, 
This means that you have to have really good data for monitoring and evaluation throughout the cycle. You can't just start at the beginning and the end. Uh, depending on the type of system you're working with, you might need monthly or in some cases bi-monthly uh, data to really understand the dynamics of the ecosystems you're working with. Remember, plant growing seasons go through seasons. Uh, you might have severe weather incidents like a drought or a flood. These are all going to impact nature-based solutions. And so that's why monitoring, while it's important in any project, it's especially important in these because the systems are quite complex. Um, what exactly needs measuring? Again, that depends on what problem you're actually addressing. If the goal is to mitigate climate change, you need to be very clear from the get-go of the project what's equations, protocols for data collection, as well as what systems are established to measure the results. So if you start with a reforestation project, and again, this sounds obvious, but it happens more often than not, don't add area in the middle of the project. You really need to have a defined area you start with and not change parameters while you're going on in the project. Um, a ton of carbon dioxide equivalent, usually CO2, but we talk about CO2 equivalent when measuring greenhouse gases, um, has the same effect on greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere as a ton of carbon dioxide sequestered in a reforestation project in Russia. So again, you have to look at what you're measuring. If you all you care about is carbon sequestration, and you can say this project in Russia and this project in Brazil have equal benefits. If you want to look at a biodiversity conservation benefit, you're more likely to pick Brazil because there's greater biodiversity the closer you get to the equator. So just things to consider. Um, it's also critical with measuring and evaluation to look beyond uh, climate and to also measure other benefits. So like the biodiversity example I just gave, if you're just counting carbon, a boreal forest in Russia and a tropical rainforest in Brazil, uh, if you have to choose between funding one, they're probably equivalent. If you wanna add a co-benefit of biodiversity, Brazil might be a better option. Again, not saying it's right or wrong, you just have to see what benefits you're trying to accomplish. Um, but realistically, most nature-based solutions projects have a range of indicators, including um, trends in species population, water quality and predictability in watershed, and increasingly, even though I didn't put it on this slide, impacts on local communities. So are household income levels growing next to the project or are they shrinking? Um, how about accessibility to goods and services for communities adjacent to this reforestation project? These are other types of measures you might be asked to look at when you do a nature-based solution. And again, I'm a little sympathetic for nature-based projects because they usually get asked to do a lot more data collection and analysis than gray infrastructure projects, which are a little more direct. And you're just looking at the piece of infrastructure and its impact on the surrounding environment. You don't look as much with social and biological systems. So as of 2016, which was the most comprehensive recent data I could find, uh, forests cover approximately 4 billion hectares worldwide. That's around one third or 31% of total land area. There probably are some more updated lists, um, but within the UN, we tend to look at land cover every five years. Um, and unfortunately, usually the update uh, for this happened during the COVID pandemic. And I haven't seen a lot more recent data, but most other proxies I've seen from NGOs that monitor this as well as some Global funding institutions uh, say it's still around 31% based on satellite imagery. Uh, between 1990 and 2000, so the last decade of the 20th century, we lost about 8.3 million hectares per year. After 2010, remember, we're still losing forests, but we started losing it at a slower rate, only about 6.2 million hectares per year. And based on satellite imagery, that trend has maintained. We're still losing forests, but we're doing it at a much slower rate globally than we were through the 20th century. It's still having a big impact on the climate though. And so not only um, 
the devastating impact of tropical forests lost on biodiversity, as well as indigenous communities that inhabit it, um, a big, big impact of forest lost, not just from tropical forests, but from temporal and boreal forests as well, um, is the release of carbon dioxide. So not only are those trees and other plants not only absorbing carbon dioxide, they're either being burned or they're breaking down over time. And that's releasing much more potent greenhouse gases into the atmosphere through uh, usually uh, methane if forests are breaking down. So when we talk about the conservation of forests to other land use, we're responsible for around 10% of net global carbon emissions. So it doesn't sound like a huge amount, um, but when you look globally at what forests could do if we gave them a chance, solving the problem of deforestation is absolutely a prerequisite in responding to climate change. And not just forests, but when we look at wider land use, including agriculture, how we treat soils, as well as ocean use, how we treat oceans, um, nature-based solutions have an even bigger role to play. Um, so this isn't the clearest map I could find, but it was the one that was most customizable. And you can see on the map which nations are doing have the most forest. Okay, so I'm going to show you three maps. Don't get too confused. This is just looking at who has the most. Any surprises in this map? Something you see that you did not expect? I was surprised given how big Canada and the United States are how much of the forest is gone compared to a country like Russia or Brazil. Anyone else, anything to notice? How about your own countries? Anything that catches your attention? Remember, this is looking at how much forest is actually there as of last official counts in 2020. All right, I'll let you not talk for this one, but then we'll move on to the next one and I will make you talk. This is how much countries are protecting ecosystems, including forest. So the green, the more green you are, you're doing better. The closer you are to the red, not good at all. How about this map? Remember, this is how much of land is forested. The more green you are, the more you have. This map is how much of that is protected. The more green you have, the more protected your resources are. So looking at the juxtaposition between these two slides, are there any surprises? It's going to be a long session if none of you talk. Yeah, uh, it's interesting to see what's happening in Northern Africa, I think, because they do yes. not have a lot of forest, but they're conserving it pretty well. Ah, uh, is North Africa conserving? It's, it's most of it's under 5%. Um, but the it's India still, one. Still better off than, yes. Mm -hmm. The India, um, sorry, the Australia, someone mentioned in the chat, just going to see this comment. Thought Australia has more forest? No, that's one of the interesting things. Australia, even though it has a paper exporting industry, it has fewer trees than any other continent. And it's still one of the developed countries in the world or high income countries that is losing forest every year. A lot of other countries that are high income, their forests are growing back. So some interesting trends. And this last map I'm going to show you. Nope. Okay, just the two for now. Okay, so why are we talking about forest conservation? Well, forest conservation plays a pivotal role in a lot of global environmental treaties around climate change for a process called RED. And RED is simply an acronym that stands for Reducing Emissions from Deforestation and Forest Degradation, R-E-D-D. -D. Um, and the RED framework is one that a lot of emerging economies have proposed 
uh, where they are rewarded financially for emissions reductions achieved that are associated with a decrease in the conversion of forests to other land uses. So by protecting their forests, they're not only helping to fight climate change, but again, it's linked to this concept of payment for ecosystem services that high emissions economies will compensate them and pay them for that ecosystem service that is a global common good. Um, so looking at the current or projected rates of deforestation and forest degradation, countries that are taking action to effectively reduce those rates are financially rewarded. So remember, red isn't perfect. It's not saying, oh, you're actively managing your forest or you're regrowing your forest, though a lot of countries have moved to that, as we'll see with the case of Costa Rica and as we heard about with Bhutan earlier in the week. But even trying to incentivize decreasing the rate of destruction of forest has been part of RED since its inception about 15 years ago. And RED provides a unique opportunity to achieve large-scale emissions reductions at apparently low abatement costs. So by providing some economic valuation of ecosystem services and the role it plays in carbon capture and storage, it allows intact forests to compete with historically more lucrative land uses, such as destroying forests for timber and then turning the land into either agriculture land, grazing, or some other use of human inhabitation. Um, in its beginning, way back in the early 2000s, RED was first and foremost focused on reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation. But in 2007, something changed. So in 2007, the climate COP was held in Bali and it formulated um, a comprehensive approach to mitigating climate change that wanted to focus on not only forest, uh, reducing emissions from forest uh, deforestation and degradation, but also wanted to up the role of conservation, sustainable management of existing forests, and the and not only that, but the enhancement of forest carbon of forest carbon stocks. And again, these are the examples we've heard about from Bhutan, and you will hear about from Costa Rica. So in 2007, there was kind of a sea change there where we get more nature-based solutions as we think of today, where a lot of forested countries said, okay, we're not only going to decrease our deforestation rates we're actually going to stop deforestation, manage our forests to protect them, and try to regrow forests so we have more forest coverage. And so that is something that was a sea change. It's like we weren't just talking about slowing deforestation, we we're actually talking about rewilding a lot of areas in different countries around the world. Um, and so until this time, even though it seems really apparent to us now, the first 10 years of climate change treaties didn't really talk about protecting nature. That really entered the global dialogue as well as global funding schemes only in 2007. So in 2010, at the Cancun agreements, RED formally became RED Plus to reflect these new components. So yes, we are still talking about reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation, but we're also talking about with nature-based solutions, conservation of existing forests, sustainable management of forests. You can still use a forest, but you have to make sure it's carbon stocks and its biodiversity are healthy, and enhancement of carbon stocks, regrowing forests. A lot of this happens naturally, but also making policy interventions so that happens a little more intentionally. Um, so within its remit, Red Plus has the potential to simultaneously contribute to not only climate change mitigation, but also poverty alleviation and helping conserve biodiversity and sustaining ecosystem services. So a win, 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 win. Again, it took about, well, over 15 years for this to even enter climate treaty talks, though, even though it seems relatively apparent to us now. Um, so if you're interested in the details of the Red Plus mechanism and how those might be used in your own countries and communities, um, please check out the UNFCCC. It should be noted a final mechanism is not completely in place yet because there hasn't been a final agreement on the needs for a full-scale implementation that's standardized. That's not being said red schemes aren't existing. 
There are many donor countries, organizations, and international development groups that are funding Red Plus solutions, and those might be applicable for your countries and community. There just isn't a global standard for how these are measured or valued yet. That can be frustrating, but remember the perfect's the enemy of the good. There's still a lot of really important, interesting work going on, even though people are still ironing out the details of how this carbon credit schemes will work. Does it benefit the donor country or the recipient country? And what prices for what parts of forests? Um, so the point below is that even though we're still hammering that out at the international legal level, many, many, many projects are already starting from private NGO and national governments, and even some uh, international groups like the European Union and the OECD. Um, why is this an ongoing issue? Well, the main stumbling block um, for a lot of Red Plus initiatives is this issue of verification. So. For example, if I'm a country and I say, well, I would have deforested this much, but because of red plus I've only deforested this much, how do you prove it? Um, and you, there are lots of models for both economic development and resource use that have been proposed. It's not saying we can't, but we really haven't gotten an answer that everyone agrees on yet. Some parties to the Paris Treaty, or sorry, some parties to the Climate Treaty have pushed for verification based on international consultation and analysis used for nationally determined appropriate mitigation actions. Others want kind of a third party verification, so just external experts, but there's a lot of concern about, well, are these people truly objective? Like if you get a bunch of biologists in there, are they gonna give me the climate credits even if I'm not satisfying their biodiversity requirements for uh, the forest that I've regrown? There's lots of contention. And as of this moment, no compromise is reached. Um, oh, sorry, and that should not say 2013, uh, but it is uh, it has currently been suspended until 2013. That was correct, sorry. So <laughs> it was suspended basically, like it was in a state of limbo between 2010 and 2013. Then finally in 2013 in COP19 in Warsaw, um, we did get to decisions about how we were going to monitor and evaluate Red Plus. Um, this proposed Warsaw framework is a package of decisions, which along with those addressed in previous COPs, uh, complements a Red Plus rule book. I encourage you to check that out if you're interested. Uh, discussions on Red Plus took place under several different negotiating bodies. So if you're interested in the, the data collection, look at the methodological issues in the subsidiary body for scientific and technical advice, or SBSTA. If you're looking at what institutional arrangements have been agreed to for joint work programs, um, you can also check out this, as well as the subsidiary body for implementation. Um, and increasingly, there are uh, financial schemes under the conference of the party for COP for Red Plus initiatives. So I encourage all of you to look what might be existing in your own countries and your own communities within your countries, because there's actually stuff happening all around the world at pretty much any place that has using rewilding as a concept for climate change mitigation or adaptation. Um, so some of the things that have been ironed out in Warsaw or modalities for monitoring systems for forests, modalities for measuring and reporting systems, how technical assessment would look for what emissions were being absorbed by forests, and looking at how to address the drivers of deforestation and forest degradation. Um, so we have been debating all of these issues extensively ever since COP16 in Mexico, and you'll still see debates about these issues pop up. But more importantly, for your activities in this program, even without final decisions on an international standard for these, there are a lot of Red Plus projects that are already in the works and are already soaking up carbon and providing co-benefits. Um, I'm going to kind of rush through this because I'm running out of time. Um, 2014, we didn't really get to anything new. 
But finally, at COP21 in 15, which was the Paris Agreement, uh, they did reach a conclusion on decisions for all of these measuring evaluation and analysis decisions for looking at how we use forests and fighting climate change. Um, and all countries were encouraged to implement and support Red Plus. So this was originally thought of as just applicable for nations with extensive rainforests. But by the time the Paris Treaty passed, um, carbon sequestration through reforesting or decreasing degradation or increasing forest stocks was seen as necessary for everyone. Um, so as of 2021, here are the current countries participating in Red Plus programs. Do you see your own country on there? And if so, did you know about an activity that's happening for either protecting existing forests or expanding forests? Or any surprises? Any countries who are like, oh, there's no red programs here, why not? Um, uh, hello, um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, someone else want to speak. Uh, I'm surprised that many developed countries not in uh, the list. Yes, and yes. this has been an yeah. issue, even though, as we saw, a lot of developed countries do have extensive forest stocks. Um, so you'll notice places like Canada and Sweden, um, even though they have pretty extensive areas of forest, uh, they're not participating in an active Red Plus program. Part of the reason for that is funding. Usually funders only fund emerging economies uh, for forest schemes. Um, but also a lot of developed economies um, are reluctant to focus on uh, reforestation because it might threaten some primary industry uh, within their borders. So I think we're still on pretty good track for time. So I'm gonna rush through the rest of these slides and then hopefully we'll have time for some more Q&A and I can refer back to one of the slides if you're curious. Okay, so this is just setting the stage for the talk that's going to come after me. Um, so looking at case study as kind of a success for doing this Red Plus approach to nature-based solutions. Um, one of Costa Rica's main success is that um, it approached reforestation in a way that wasn't popular at the time. And so reforestation was really not a conservation priority during the 1980s and 1990s when Costa Rica was launching its program. A lot of biologists, especially from the Western world, are kind of puritanical. They thought old growth forests were the only thing worth protecting. Nature that was regenerated from a growing secondary forest or a forest that you know springs up after trees have been cut really wasn't going to be interesting or good habitat for wildlife. Um, Costa Rica took a different approach to that though. And reforestation on former agricultural lands or after timber harvest had been done uh, started occurring in the late 1980s. And this was not only, it did sequester carbon, um, but it had a lot more success in protecting the country's biodiversity than a lot of conservationists from the 1980s and 1990s thought it would. And because this biodiversity conservation was a twinned objective with its restoration, in addition to fighting climate change, um, the country has been able to avoid fast growing plantation forestry monoculture and instead focused on reforestation of mixed tropical hardwoods that are native to the country. So as I said, not all nature-based solutions are good for biodiversity. You might have monoculture of a bamboo or a palm species that's probably not going to be ideal habitat or food sources for local wildlife, and it might not provide the same ecosystem services as a mixed forest. But Costa Rica was aware of that and did allow for native trees to regrow on formerly uh, harvested land. Um, and this has not only occurred in tropical lowland forests, but also um, higher elevation temperate forests within Costa Rica's mountains. Uh, which again, 
the country didn't just focus on tropical forests, but also looked at its higher elevation temperate forests, which was seen as less important for protecting biodiversity, but actually has played a huge role in protecting biodiversity and increasing carbon stocks. So during the 90s, um, Costa Rica launched one of the fir world's first national payment for ecosystem services programs. And it actually incented farmers and rural landowners to protect the biodiversity, capture carbon by not chopping trees and protecting local watersheds. Through this incentive scheme, Costa Rica avoided the puritanical approach that saw only untouched old growth primary forest as worth protecting that's characterized by a lot of countries in very highly developed economies. So the United States, Canada, Australia, there hasn't been a lot of attention, not only to paying people for protecting services, but also to the value of regenerating ecosystems. It's just seen as well, it'll never be as good as it was, so why bother? Costa Rica avoided this and has had a lot of success in not only expanding its forest stocks, but protecting its biodiversity th through this. Um, so I'm sure that our next lecture will get into this a little more, but um, Costa Rica is able to pay for its um, payment for eco services program uh, through a government scheme, which is financed predominantly through taxing fossil fuels. And over its first 20 years of existence, this fund has allowed for the reforestation of nearly one fifth of Costa Rica's total land area, there's over 7 million trees planted as of 2022. 